So, hello everyone. It's really good to be here. Uh, we were here two years ago. It's really good to be back and do uh, another talk. So, I'm Andrea. Uh, I'm Daniele. So, this talk was actually done by four of us. Uh, it was done also with Adam Nori and Zach Franken from uh, Aperture Labs, which unfortunately uh, they couldn't be here. Uh, so, we talk about uh, credit card skimming um, related to a new technology called EMV, which involves uh, having a chip on your credit card. Um, so, uh, and also, as you will see, I, I'm not sure how many of you, uh, of you have seen our presentation, we always try uh, to put a silly video in our presentation which, which proves uh, how you can use our techniques to, to get girls, because we think it's very important as a message to show that you can use these highly technical techniques also for, for, you know, the greater good, you know, otherwise you end up with a very boring talk that no one remembers, you know, so at the end, at the middle of the presentation there will be a, a very silly movie that will ruin our reputation completely, so look forward to that. So what is EMV? EMV is a standard which has been developed uh, by MasterCard and Visa uh, and also Europay, which is what regulates when you use credit cards that use a chip. So every time you see a credit card with a chip, it means that the EMV protocol is being spoken by the car and by the terminal which reads the card. Uh, and this, this technology is marketed as chip and pin in many countries and as well it has other names. Every country can decide to market it uh, in different ways. Um, so why oh, are they moving to a new standard which involves the chip? So the, the, the reason is pretty obvious. Uh, it's because they want to move away from Max, right? Because as we know, and as has been pointed out by Adam Laurie several times in, in his talks, the Max stripe is completely insecure. You can clone, you can skim. Skim is the act of cloning the car by using a, a special device. Uh, credit card with Max drive very, very easily. There's nothing uh, secure about that technology. Um, one other reason is because you can do offline card verification and transaction approval, which means that your credit card terminal, in order to approve the transaction, doesn't need to actually make a connection to the back end uh, in order to validate the card. It can do everything on its own, which is considered to be a feature somehow. Uh, but we'll see why uh, this is not a really a good thing. And also you can have multiple applications on one car, so you just don't have one max drive, you have a chip which can support uh, different kind of, of applications, so uh, you can have your debit card and your credit card in one card. You can potentially also have a Visa and a MasterCard in one card, but of course they don't do that from a marketing perspective, but you can also have that. So th these are one of the reasons. However, there's one big problem, which really what's prompted uh, our research as well as research from, from other security uh, researchers is that this technology allows for a liability shift. So what does it mean? It means that uh, while the liability shifts away from, from the merchant to the bank, which is a good thing, uh, and it is also one of the, the ways that he's been using for actually pushing uh, the technology, uh, because merchants, they have to implement, they have to buy terminals with EMV in order to have the, the liability shifted away from them. But also, uh, there's a worrying trend of making the cardholder liable uh, in case there was an EMV transaction which used the correct PIN. Uh, because the PIN is becoming the proof of the cardholder presence. Uh, it is considered to be this magic secure number that if for any reason it is given away, it means that you, the cardholder, was negligent in storing it. Maybe because you, you wrote it on a piece of paper uh, or, or you, 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 you disclose it somewhere. Um, and this, of course, if it turns out that the PIN is not actually a very secure uh, piece of information, it turns out to be uh, a problem. And that's why we think um, uh, security of the EMV protocol is really important. Um, also, uh, depending on the bank and depending on the country, uh, the liability uh, protection might not apply to ATM transactions because, of course, when you, when you go to an ATM and you always have to use the PIN for ATM transactions, you can get cash directly. And that's why sometimes the liability does not apply there. Um, so this is one example of, uh, of this problem which happened very recently in June of this year. It actually happened uh, after we presented our research. So there's been a fraud case for $81,000 where someone bought a race car with a credit card, 
like, which is funny. Uh, and, and of course, the customer said, I never did that. And, and the bank said, our records show that this was a chip and pin transaction. This means the customer personal card and personal pin number were used in carrying out this transaction. As a result, the customer is liable for the transaction. And this is exactly what we're talking about. And this guy is in a lawsuit right now with a bank trying to prove that he didn't buy a car, a race car, actually, with, with his credit card. Um, so, so the adoption of VMB is, is quite massive in Europe. I mean, nearly every single country in Europe now implements VMB. Um, and even if uh, this technology is supposed to um, migrate away from the Mac stripe, Mac stripe is still accepted pretty much everywhere in Europe because as long as every single country in the world or every single country which is considered important by the banks does not move to the chip, of course we still need to have the Mac stripe on the terminals and on the cards because we don't want people to travel abroad having a car with just the chip and then having the car not working. So, there, so this is a problem because Mac stripe fallback is still accepted and and there's a funny thing, you can always trigger a max stripe fallback with your car. So if you swipe a card which has a chip, the max stripe will tell the reader that you have a chip. And the terminal will say, oh, well, you have a chip, so we got to use the chip. But then if you put a chip which is not readable, or if you insert the card in the wrong way, then the terminal won't be able to read the chip and will say, okay, let's use the max stripe. So you can always fall, fall back to max stripe, regardless of the fact that your card has the chip. Uh, which pretty much at this point defies the point of, of, uh, of the, the chip because if you, can if you can skim the max stripe, you can still use it despite the fact that EMV is widely adopted. So there's already been research about EMV uh, done by the excellent group of researchers at Cambridge. So what they've shown is that you can actually uh, steal a car and use the car without a pin, which of course defines the, the, the point of chip and pin. Um, and this was an implementation flaw actually. Uh, not a not a design flaw, so this flaw can potentially be fixed. But of course, it's not going to be fixed. Only one bank, I think, fix it because they're being very lazy. Uh, and also, every time you have one of these problems, the industry claims that it's very difficult and impractical to do uh, these kind of attacks. Um, and we're going to talk about that. So, what our research does, it follows up from the Cambridge uh, research. And we see, first of all, what can we do with, with, with skimming. So skimming means that we have a hidden electronic device which can intercept the communication between the car and the terminal. Um, so what can we do with, with, with the chip and pin skimmer? Okay, so you probably heard the term uh, skimming referred to max drive. So when you steal the information from a max drive car, uh, you use a, a max drive skimmer. And we're going to see what we can do with a chip skimmer. Um, and we're going to see if we can harvest the pins because, again, they're uh, a critical component of the liability shift on point of sales terminals. And we ignore max stripe skimming uh, because, I mean, lots of other people already talked about that. So this is an example of ATM skimmers that are being used uh, right now. Uh, you can see here, this device here was actually overlaid on the ATM and it contains an EMB skimmer in it. Uh, and usually what you have while you skim the max stripe, you also need some kind of camera or a phone that can actually uh, look on the pin pad and then see when you're typing your pin. Uh, which of course it's a very manual process. You need someone to correlate the timing between whatever is fetched by this device and whatever is recorded by the camera and you gotta, you know, understand the hand gesture and, and get the pin. One other option, more invasive, you can overlay a fake pin pad on the ATM, which can also relay the information over GSM SIM or, or whatever. This is actually one other example of an, an, a chip, uh, sorry, a max stripe skimmer. So we predict that, of course, when max stripe goes away, but and also on point of sales terminals, that skimming the chip will become the, the next big thing because the chip interface is accessible by design. So it becomes impossible for the user to verify if a chip skimmer is being inserted or not. Uh, if you have a max stripe skimmer on a point of sales, you might be able, if, you're, if, you're atten if, you're, if you put enough attention, you might be able to understand if there are two max stripe heads instead of just one. But if you have a chip skimmer inside the terminal, there's no way you can see it. Um, so an, an EMV skimmer can really go undetected for a very, very long time, which of course uh, is a problem. So the industry, 
loves to point fingers and impracticality. The industry says, well, if you're going to implement a chip skimmer, it got to look like this. This is going to be your chip skimmer, okay? You're going to need a fuel tank. It's going to be something big and very impractical. You, you, you would spend lots of money, so it will never work. So that's why we did this. So this, maybe you want to talk about it? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, it doesn't look like, like a shuttle. <laughs> so yeah, this is uh, our um, EMV skimmer prototype. Um, it's quite simple. The, 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 the whole uh, logical part of the schema is contained in, in a single integrated circuit. And um, basically this, uh, this kind of schema offers um, a lot of advantages. For instance, the installation of the schema itself is quite, you know, easy. Because we, you can, what you can do is to hook the, the actual schema uh, on a special card. And that allows you to insert the schema and to, uh, into the, um, the card slot of the, of the POS device. And so the, that, of course, the, this, this terminal is open just yeah, for the just benefit for of seeing the schema inside. But once it's inside, you will never be able to see it. The, the other advantage is that the, this kind of schema um, uh, has it, it's that uh, it can be powered by the POS device itself. So it doesn't require any external battery or something. And of course, the data that it can collect from the, uh, from the transactions uh, can be downloaded in a, in, a, I don't know, in a second moment by using a special card that can be recognized by the schema itself. And, and yeah, as, as I say, the, the, the development effort is quite uh, little and it's, it's quite cheap. And, and as we can see, this is extremely thin. I mean, you can, if you, if you want to see this device and close, we can, of course, show it to you after the presentation. It is very, very, very thin. And, and it really can go undetected. So, so let me show you one ex a few examples of why these devices can actually be inserted inside a point of sale device without being noticed. So, because of course, these devices, they have tamper-proof sensors. So, uh, we analyze free devices which are the most commonly uh, deployed around Europe. 90% of the terminals around Europe are made from these brands and are exactly this model. So this is um, the first one we analyze. And so this is the actual smart card enclosure here. So our device goes right inside here and you would never be able to see that it's actually inserted here. Uh, and so remember this design because we're going to get back to actually to this enclosure here. Uh, and if we open the device, we see that actually there are some security pins. So this pin over here makes contact with the actual chassis of the terminal. And you have two pins, one here and one here. And so what happens is that when you open the device, if you try to mess with the device, the security pins get triggered and it will erase the security module of the terminal. That's its primary function. And the secondary function is it will prevent the terminal to actually work. So the security module is a piece of, is a, is a chip on the terminal which is powered by a battery and holds the symmetric key which is actually used for verifying that the car is actually legitimate. But the interesting thing is that the security module is actually not used by EMV at all. Uh, the security module is used by proprietary application that needs a symmetric key to be shared between the car and the terminal. So, so that function is actually not proactive for EMV protection. But of course the fact that the device is actually uh, stops working, then of course that's a problem for every single transaction that you're trying to do. But the problem is that these security pins, they actually do not protect the, the, the chip interface. In all our tests, we were able to insert uh, the skimming device without actually triggering any of these, of these sensors. Because this is the actual enclosure of, of, of this marker, and there's nothing which, there's no sensor, there's no volumetric sensor, there's nothing here that would actually prevent um, a schema from being inserted. And this is the actual security module of, of the terminal. This is its battery, and this is the one that is actually being protected by the pins. So you also have security pins here protecting the pin pad. 
So if you're trying to slide something uh, within the, the pin pad layer and the actual board, then you will cut the connection of these pins and that will also trigger uh, the security, the intrusion sensor of the device, preventing the device uh, to work. So, but all of this really doesn't prevent uh, bad things to happen. This is one other device which we analyzed, um, which is very well done in the inside. So we see again here, so this is a pin pad pr protection. So in case you're tapping your pin and you don't want the merchant to see the pin. Uh, we have the MaxRap reader here, and this is the actual uh, smart card enclosure. And this unit is actually very well done inside. So we have one security switch again, which prevents, if you, if you just try to open the device, uh, that will be triggered right away. Um, again, uh, security switches over here. One is unused, the other one is used. Uh, and this is the actual security module, which is also well protected. If you try to slide everything through, um, it, it won't work, but as we can see, this, the actual smart card enclosure is completely, uh, of course, it, it's very hard to protect it because if you want to insert your card in the first place, then, then how do you protect it? Uh, we also have the security uh, pins here for the pin pad, and this is the actual pin pad. Um, so these are the security pins. But what you can do with this device, this is pretty funny. The fact that it has a pin pad protection here actually helps you in skimming the pin pad if you, if you really want. So we built a prototype that creates an overlaid pin pad here and then slides inside the actual smart and enclosure to actually, uh, to actually skim the max, right? So this is how it's supposed to work. And what we did, we created a fake pin pad plate which could just be overlaid. So this is, this is the device compromise with the overlaid pin pad. And it would be very difficult to see. And actually there's a circuit underneath and the actual smart reader going inside. That the actual, our skimmer goes inside the smart reader. So, so the point we're trying to make is that no matter what kind of physical protection you will try to implement on your device, there will always be a chance for actually skimming things mechanically if you really want to. Uh, and this is another view of the device being, being skimmed. Um, then there's also this device, which was really fun. So this device, uh, again, it tries to have security pins. There's one here for actually protecting the security module, which is powered by this battery. And it does a decent job. However, it has one big problem. So here in this view, we'll see that we have these this part where we have exposed the, actually, uh, the actual SIM interface, the, SIM, the, the, the interface that connects to the actual chip and also the interface which connects to, to the actual pin pad. And the problem is that while if you dismantle the device, you trigger the sensor and this device will stop from working, what you can do, you can lift the LCD display and you can expose these two chips and nothing, nothing will ever be triggered. So what you can do, and we tested this, you can do it in less than 10 minutes. If you have your device, you can carefully detach this display without, uh, without uh, dismantling the device, without opening anything, and you will expose. So you got step one, and you will expose these two contacts. And once you've done that, you can install um, it's something, I don't know if you ever hack your Wii, your Nintendo Wii, but you have some plugs that they get overlaid on the chip and they intercept all the pin. So what you can do, you will get the keypad information from here and you will also get uh, access to, to the actual smart card uh, which is being inserted. And then you can put the LCD display back in and no one, there's no, there's no way that no one will ever detect that you've done something like this. So. From a tamper-proof point of view, you can always play really nasty things with the point-of-sale devices. You always have to assume that your point-of-sale device is really not trusted, which, which means that it putting the pin inside, it's, it's, you know, it's really not the, the most secure thing. But we'll see how things is, are actually much worse than this. So, so we think that the fact that you, you can mechanically hack these devices, and, and most important, you can insert something like this, within the point of sale device, without triggering anything, we think it's problematic. And now we're going to talk about what you can actually get, which kind of data you can get 
by using this device and how you can leverage any attacks from, from this. But as we think we bored you enough, so this is, this is the part where we show how you can get girls with our research because we think it's very important not to bore the audience. And if you've seen our presentation from two years ago, you will know that there's an ongoing start of these very cheesy movies. So to any of you that hasn't seen our movies, it's the evil hacker versus the failed porn star. Of course, I'm the evil hacker and he's the failed porn star. Of course. I'm, I'm the boss, so I decide what to do. Uh, and so we had a series of epic failure uh, on, on, by the failed porn star. He was typing on, on his laptop and it was freaking laser beams that were actually analyzing the keystrokes and then the evil hacker was actually being able to intercept everything that he was typing. This was talk from two years ago. This is actually can be done for real. Uh, so this is the face of epic fail. And this is the return of investment. Okay, so this is this is a business-friendly presentation. If you see, if you show this slide to your manager, you will be able to get budget for every kind of attack you wanna you wanna investigate. Uh, so, so yes, so return of investment. So it, it really works. So now we're gonna show you how you can do this thing by with credit cards. So come on, darling, I wanna buy you a very expensive present. Yeah, sure. Hello? Hello there. <coughs> so, my woman needs some glasses. Sure. Oh These are the latest ones. Wow, beautiful. So your experience may differ. So if you do this and it doesn't work, don't sue us, okay? It's not our fault. It might be because you're not Italian, I don't know. It might just not work. Also, I'm not sure why when, you, when your credit cards don't work, you say that you're alone. I mean, why was I it your life? It was all improvisation. It's really good in these roles, yeah. I have to say. So anyway, so let's get to the boring part back again. So go ahead. So, uh, so the information on the EMV chips uh, is uh, are stored in um, in a file system. So um, the data is organized in um, different applications, files, and records. And the way um, so the terminal basically um, talks to the card using. Um, a formalism that's, that's called uh, APDU messages. 
Um, APDU messages are, using, uh, are used for uh, reading uh, the records and issuing commands from the terminal to the card. Here uh, we have two, two examples. The first one is uh, uh, select, uh, basically, basically it's the command that selects which application to use on, on the card. And the second one is a verify pin. Yeah, we, we will see. But Sorry. We will see a little bit more about the pin verification in the, the next slides. Um, so basically, what our schema uh, does is to intercept the communication between the, the card and the terminal. So we are making a man in the middle, a usual ma man in the middle attack. So uh, during the communication between the terminal and, and the card, the first step is you know the, to, initi to initiate the uh, the application processing. That means that the terminal basically select which application uh, to use. Actually, it's the operator that select using using you know the terminal. The, the operator can select if using Visa or you know if the card contains different application, which one is uh, is going to use. Uh, read application data. Uh, so basically, the terminal uh, reads all the records uh, that are interesting for the for making the actual transaction from from the card, and after the uh, the, the application data is read. Um, we have to perform the uh, data authentication um, and the carrier verification. Um, and after that, you know, the, the actual transaction goes on. And finally, we have the issue script processing. This is an optional step, and it's used by, by the issue, for instance, I don't know, to change the pin on the card. Um, so uh, the application data on the card is uh, stored using a bare TLV uh, formalism. And here we have a couple of uh, different examples, a couple of different tags. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, the first one is the application identifier. It can, can be Visa or MasterCard or whatever. Uh, the second one is the language, the language preference tag. In this case, uh, you know, the language preference is set uh, on Italian, English, French, and so Daniela's card language yeah. preference is broken. So as a second language, That's instead cool. of English, he has German. Yeah, so every time he goes abroad, the ATM cool. says things in German, which of course he cannot understand. Yeah. Which it's, so yeah. if that's yeah. messed up, that's a real problem. Yeah. That's annoying. Yeah. Uh, track one discretionary data and track two uh, equivalent data. We will see a little bit more about those two tracks in the next slides. Um, so we have we have other interesting things here like the um, the credit card number the PAN uh, the card holder verification method list um, yeah and we're gonna see that later. yeah we can see the name uh, and of course you have the counter of the transaction and the pin try counter in order to be able you know to understand if if you are over with the with the pin or a tries so. The first question that, that we posed ourselves was just by getting this data, which is read in the clear by the terminal uh, from the car, can we do a max stripe clone? So because we have the, the name, we have the expiration date, we have track one and track two, uh, track one discretionary data and track one equivalent data, which is actually a copy of what is on the max stripe. So, can we do a max stripe clone? So it used to be that, yes, you can do 100% valid max stripe clone from the chip. So if you skim the chip, you can clone to a max stripe, and then you can use the card, whatever you want, as a max stripe. So they figured that out after a few years, and they thought, oh, maybe it's a bad thing. Um, and, and now they, they, they put a three digits number, which is different on the chip compared to the one on the max stripe. So when you try to make a clone from the chip to the max stripe, you will get everything right except for the three digit number, which is the actual CVV. So, and, and, and the, this different CVV, they call it iCVV. So, and, and nowadays it should be present on every single card. So um, the problem is that, um, Knowing that the entire security of the, of the data read from the chip is based on a three digits number when it comes to cloning to a max drive is really worrying. Because if a chip skimmer is installed 
again, it can really go undetected for a very long time, and it can potentially skim thousands of cards every day. Which means that if you try a random CVV number, you will get one of them right, or even more than one of them right. Uh, and also, many backends, many bank backends, they fail to warn the customer or to trigger any alert if you try uh, to, to, to swipe a Mac stripe which has the incorrect CVV number. You will never get an alert. We actually tested this. So, you know, it is better than doing 100% accurate clone, but it still, you know, it, it still doesn't protect. Uh, and, and of course, we think uh, this is a problem. So this is one thing that you can do. Uh, and again, as what I said before, uh, if you swipe a Mac stripe, which has a service code which tells to the, to the, to the terminal, oh, well, you have a chip, then you can always insert a chip which doesn't work, and you will be able to swipe the Mac stripe again. So what about online usage? So can we use the data which is present on the chip to actually make an online usage? So, so you would think that nowadays every website, you know, asks you for the security code, which is the code which is printed on the back of the car or on the front of the car for American Express. Um, and you also might think that you have verified by Visa and MasterCard secure code which protects you with an additional password. But surprisingly, the number of websites which don't check these, these values is still nowadays worrying. And actually, it was very ironic. While we were developing this talk, my credit card got frauded. And got frauded by only stealing the information that you can actually read from the chip. And Adam Lowry's son card also got frauded. So what are the chances of actually two speakers out of four being frauded while developing this talk? I think it really proves uh, our point. So, so what they did, they used my credit card information on the Dolce & Gabbana website, very glamour, and because this website has an optional security code. So if you don't put a security code, your transaction will go through and you will get your goods delivered in 24 hours. So what they did, they bought $2,000 of merchandise and then $200 of merchandise, and they sent the $200 merchandise to me as a gift, paid with my own money, which was very nice. You know, they were probably doing for testing if, uh, you know, if my credit card really works. Um, and and I, I didn't check if nowadays they still do that, but they have, they've been doing this for a very long time. And also there are companies that their entire existence is based on brokering transactions without security code. They assume the liability in case a fraud is being reported, and they do that because they know that the percentage of fraudulent transaction not being reported is much higher than the ones that gets reported. So they use my credit card on one of these very dodgy companies that just gives you cash just when you give them a credit card number, and also on a chocolate website. So they got chocolate, which, yeah, that's good. I would have done the same thing. I would have bought chocolate. So, so we mentioned offline data authentication when it comes to uh, the credit card transaction. So what is it about? So uh, there are three different um, methods um, to per in order to perform offline data authentication. Um, and so there are three different uh, families of, of cards, the SDA cards, the DDA cards, and the CDA cards. Um, so we are talking about the method used by the terminal in order to validate the data, per, the, the data present on, on the card. Um, so uh, this doesn't apply to the uh, ATM transactions because ATM always goes um, online. And the other important thing to notice is that uh, Visa and MasterCard, they mandate that all the cards issued after the 2011 should use at least DDA. Um, but this is really not yeah, happening. We still is. see cards issued in 2011 which don't use DDA. And anyway, we'll see later that this is totally irrelevant. Yeah, this is not important. Actually, yeah, in, our, in our test, we, we, we tested, I don't know, maybe 40, 40 yeah, cards, and out of 40 cards, only one was DDA, one 39 were SDA. And my new card, which I got this year because mine was frauded, uh, is actually a, still an SDA card, and it will expire in 2015. But again, we'll see, it does not matter. Oh, yeah, and the other thing that I'm missing, uh, this, is, uh, this is relevant also, um, you know, for offline transaction, because this mechanism allows you to enable an offline transaction when, when it's, uh, it's supported. Uh, of course, offline transactions are not, uh, not, are not that common, common in Europe. Common in Europe 
but 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 still, yeah, this is still relevant for. Yeah, and and also keep in mind that this standard was actually designed to enable offline yeah. transactions. So if we find flaws in our offline transactions are being performed, of course it means that the yeah, protocol the whole point of sucks. Standard. So. Uh, SDI cards are uh, the cheapest uh, uh, and the most widely used technology, maybe <laughs> because they are the cheapest, <laughs> uh, the cheapest way. Um, so basically, what what um, what is used it, it's uh, uh, in, in this kind of card is a static uh, signature, um, and uh, a symmetric key is used for the online transaction. But um, and the, the 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 important thing about this card is that. Uh, they can only perform uh, an offline PIN verification in clear text. So the PIN is always sent from the card to the terminal in clear text with this kind of... of when you have the offline PIN verification, yeah. you can also have online PIN if, verification, I would yeah, say. If you have the offline. If it's offline, it's always clear text. It's always clear text. Um, DDA cards are uh, more expensive because uh, the, the hardware involved in this kind of card is different. They, they have a, an encryption uh, coprocessor inside the, the, the actual the actual chip. Um, so basically, in this kind of they, they are able to perform uh, proper encryption and they are able to perform a dynamic data validation. Uh, so basically, the terminal and the card exchange a, a random number and and they perform a dynamic uh, data validation. Um, and in this case, the offline PIN verification can be clear text or enciphered because they have the, 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 proper, encipher, the, the proper cryptographic coprocessor. So, so what can you do by knowing all of this? So SDA cards, as the signature verification is not dynamic, it means you can clone the card because the signature is just a piece of text that applies to the data. And you can use it without PIN for offline transactions, or even with the PIN. The thing is that you can clone the car and you can have it say yes for every PIN verification, because the terminal asks the PIN to the car, and the car says, oh, yes, that's valid, or no, that's not valid. So if you make a clone, you can make a clone that will say yes to everything uh, you want. But this only works for offline transactions, because online transactions, they still use a, a cryptogram which is based on a symmetric key which you cannot clone easily because that's what smart cards are all about. But for offline transactions, you can do whatever you want because you can create a fake cryptogram and the terminal will have no way to actually understand if the cryptogram is legitimate or not because the terminal relies on SDA in order to check that your card is valid. And of course, SDA in this card, in this case, would be valid because you can just clone it. So a DDA card clone is ineffective for offline and on, on, online transaction. However, there are two things that you can do. The first thing is that you can present a valid DDA card to pass offline transaction, and then you can create a fake cryptogram, uh, which means that you can still have an offline transaction that eventually will never go through. Also, what you can do, as every single terminal and every single card is required to support SDA, you can just present an SDA car with the data that you get off the DDA. You can always downgrade to that. So it really doesn't matter what kind of technology you use. You can always fool the terminal in case of offline transactions, which defies the point of this technology being pushed for offline transactions. But the good news is that offline transactions are very rare in Europe. Uh, so this is not really a good attack scenario. It just show you slowly that this protocol is very badly designed. So, so what we discussed so far is that you can steal the data in order to potentially clone to max drive with some effort to brute force your three digits number. And also we know that the Cambridge attack shows that you can use a stolen car without a pin. And this is an implementation flaw because what actually they do when the verify pin command happens they will tell the terminal, yeah, sure, the pin was correct, and they will never say anything to the card. So the card has never verified the pin. The terminal thinks that the pin has been verified, the pin has been verified, and each transaction will go through. However, this is an implementation flaw, because there's a piece of information which is sent by the card in the cryptogram, which will tell the backend, hey, I never verified the pin. 
and the terminal will send to the backend, hey, I did verify the ping. So the backend could correlate these two numbers and see, hey, wait a minute, the terminal says it verified the ping, but the car did not. So that's the problem. So you can immediately know that this attack has been taken place. And the only reason why this attack is being prevented is because most implementation they really suck because when you have a standard which is published in four books which are 100 pages long and no standard needs to be as long as that. If you have a standard which is that long, it is broken no matter what. You can just look at the paper you say that's broken because there are too many pages. And, and, and what happens is that they get the implementation wrong because this is too complex. But if this attack is fixed, remember the liability shift. Can we still get the pin? Can we still harvest the pin and then use a stolen car? Because that would be a massive problem for the final customer. And remember, if you have the pin, you can go to an ATM and you can get cash. So, we talk about the CVM list, which is published by the card and read by the terminal. So the CVM list tells the terminal the way the card holder verification can happen. So we have things like plain text pin verification and cipher pin verified online plain text pin verification and signature, we have the signature or we have no verification at all. So when you pay in toll roads, you have no time to sign anything or to type a pin. That's when no CVM is being selected. And this is a list. So the card presents a list of methods to the terminal and the terminal can select them in the order of priority. If the terminal doesn't support one for any reason, it can skip to the next one and so on. Uh, so if your credit card has signature first and then PIN verification, you will likely always have to sign. If you have PIN verification first and then signature, if the terminal supports it, then you get PIN uh, verification. Otherwise, it will skip to the next one and it will ask for a signature. So this list used not to be signed by SDA or DDA uh, within the card. Now, they sign it because they want this list to be tamper-proof because they want, you cannot mess with, with this list. So it is commonly believed that if you have um, signature or in cipher pin verified online or in cipher pin verification by ECC present and selected, then the pin is not sent by the terminal to the card in a clear text or not sent to the card at all. And it is believed that only when you have plain text pin verification present and selected from the CVM list, then you can harvest the PIN, okay? So this is some kind of protection they, build it, they built in. Uh, so assume a scenario where we only have DDA cards, so the modern one. This is actually a most modern uh, standard, which is called CDA, which is combined data authentication, which combines the authentication with the actual cryptogram, but we've never seen that used uh, with chip cards. It's just used with RFID cards, which is an entire new chapter. So assume that we have DDA cards, and assume we have a secure CVM, which only says encipher pin verified online or encipher pin verified by the card. Can we still harvest the pin? So there's a piece of information called issue action codes on the card, and these are called the issuer action codes, which are paired with the terminal action codes, which is a similar attribute which is present on the terminal. So what these attributes do, they specify which failure condition trigger online transactions. So to give you one example, this one example of issuer action codes present on Visa cards, these action codes here say, do not deny a transaction without attempting to go online. If offline SDA fails, transmit the transaction online. So you have one piece of data on the card, which is signed, which can tell the terminal what to do if the signature verification fails and the terminal will honor that. So this, this is a security problem. You cannot have a piece of data which is signed, which if the signature is invalidated, then it can still tell the terminal what to do. And this is a problem because when we needed to, in every tested terminal and card combination, we could always manipulate the action code so that messing with the CVM list would not result in offline rejection, which is a key component if you want to change the CVM list. And the thing is that the modified CVM list, even if the signature gets invalidated, is always honored by the terminal. So no matter what the CVM list is, no matter what the type of the car is, you can always force plain text pin verification performed by the car. So no matter what they do on the car side, you can always 
force the pin to be transmitted in the clear text to the, to the card, which means that you can always skim the pin no matter what. So all the security features that are in place for protecting the pin are completely useless because you can always perform a classic downgrade attack. And this is one example of the pin being intercepted uh, by, by the skimmer. So this is a transaction log of, of a DDA card with online pin verification only. So we see that we select the visa application, we read the data files here, and then we generate the cryptogram, which this is the actual part where the transaction goes online. Uh, if we change the CVM list and the action codes in this case, we get exactly the same thing, but at some point we witness the pin, the pin verification. So we see that the pin 1234 was actually being uh, uh, sniffed here by the skimmer, and then we have the online transaction with the same car with our skimmer just performing a man in the middle attack. Um, which means that your skimmer can nicely get all the public information that we discussed before and the pin number. There's no camera being involved, there's no manual correlation that you need to do. You hook up the skimmer and at the end of the day or at the end of the week you go there with your special car and you get a nicely formatted file which gives you name, number, expiration date, all the other information and the pin number with 100% accuracy. Um, and there's little that the backend can do to detect this because what they will detect is that the SDA fail, which can happen for uh, several reasons, to be honest, and we don't think it's a realistic scenario to just block a car because SDA failed. And anyway, as the CVM result, which is a piece of information which is sent to the backend to, to, to let uh, the backend know what car holder verification method has been performed, it only includes the last car holder verification method being tried. So one of the options that you can do, you can get the pin, you can relay the wrong pin back to the car, and then you can present in your CVM list online pin verification. And in the CVM result that the backends will see, they will only see the last CVM which has been trying, which is online pin verification. It means that, of course, you get prompted twice for the pin, but you just might think that you would just type it in incorrectly. So there are several ways that you can, you can do for actually avoiding backend detection. Um, there's also... Um, there's also one other option which we didn't test uh, because we didn't have time. Uh, it might also be possible to exploit the fact that the actual offline data authentication is not really tied in a very strong way to the actual cryptogram generation or it is tied in ways that can be manipulated. So it might be possible to, to present a valid SDA cards for the actual offline authentication and for the authentication phase with the CVM list and then use a real card for the actual transaction which means that the backend will see everything being done uh, correctly. Um, so CDA, which is Combined Data Authentication, it was designed to prevent against similar attacks, but the problem is that you can always force, uh, you can always prevent the CDA relevant attributes to be seen from the terminal, and you can always downgrade a CDA card to DDA or to SDA, so you can always do uh, these kind of tricks. And, and of course you will see, so they did, they did SDA, and it wasn't good enough. So then they did DDA, and it wasn't still good enough. And then they did CDA. You can see that there's a trend of mistakes being made, or, or, or actually very bad design. And, and of course, catching these things, it's not easy for the industry. Uh, so this protocol is really not properly designed, and that's why we think it should be really be replaced, which of course it will never happen. So we think that the EMV schema really poses a serious threat due to the ease installation and difficult detection. You can still nowadays in 2011 use the data that you scheme uh, for attempt to do a max threat clone or to use it on online website as I've been you know, a victim of that so that really happens. And most important, this magic number that really in, in many countries shifts the liability onto you Remember, $80,000 of fraud uh, being, being claimed and being debated in court. The pin can always be intercepted, always, despite the car type and despite the, the configuration that's present on the car. And this enables full usage if you steal a car and raise a serious liability uh, considerations. Um, we got then response, which of course was useless. They say, oh, well, the full, full payment process is taken into account. Suitable countermeasures are available. 
MasterCard's spokesman response was very nice. He said in an interview that the EMV system is simply too complex for an easy fix, which, first of all, is not true. And second of all, if you really think that, it means you've got to replace this right away. Because if your system is so complex that you cannot patch it for security reasons, you're doomed. What if we find a new vulnerability, which is even more serious than this one, okay? What, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to tell me that the system is too complex and you cannot patch it? It is a basic property of every system that you should be able to patch it in case of security problems. So, you know, that really was a bad response. And actually, again, it can be fixed. Of course, you break compatibility with the standard, so we got to change the standard in order to fix this. But in the Netherlands, uh, the hole has been reportedly closed by updating uh, POS firmware with a version which disables plain text bin verification for domestic cards because in the Netherlands they know that every single card is DDA issued in the country. So what they did is said, okay, when we see that a card comes from our country, we disable uh, plain text bin verification. Now, I'm not saying that they really fixed the problem. We didn't test this, but we don't think that every terminal in the Netherlands has every single credit card number that was issued in the Netherlands. We think that they check the country code, and the country code is not signed. So maybe if you change the country code, you disable this. So, you know, you got to be careful. But anyway, so they, uh, this was, you know, after hacking the box Amsterdam, uh, actually right before, so they felt threatened by the fact that this uh, the previous presentation was being performed. So they shut down every single POS in the country for four hours. People were very pissed because of this. But they fixed it, so it can be done. Of course it can be done. Uh, so uh, we still think that this standard should be, uh, you know, replaced if possible, but it will never happen. You know, it, you, what should really be happening, you should have proper crypto, because you can, with a this marker, be implemented by the car to the back end, you know. So even if you don't trust the terminal, it doesn't matter. So because no information is sent in the clear, and this can be done. The terminals cannot be trusted. The pin uh, input and verification should be either confined on the car itself, which latest NFC technology, you know, where you actually put a pin on the phone, they're moving into the right direction, I have to say. Of course, it is scary to have your pin verification on a phone which runs billions of different applications, but, you know, conceptually, it, it might be a good way to approach the problem. Uh, and terminals cannot be trusted. I mean, remember this first terminal that, that, that we show you? It looks fine, right? You know, no problem with that. But then you have a pin pad schema underneath. Because what you can do, you can lift off this thing in half a second. In half a second, that thing pops off. You put your thing, you put it back, and you're done. Two seconds It really what it takes. And we have this board with up to switches that actually is very thin as well. It could be thinner that actually can relay uh, the pin information back to you. So, you know, even if we do these elegant EMV protocol downgrading attacks, you can never trust your terminal. Never, ever. Um, and so, recommendation, of course, you can patch EMV, just disable plain text pin verification, you know, and always do things online. It doesn't matter if you only have SDA cards. We actually spoke to the banks, and when we explained to them how EMV works, they were like, well, we don't need all of this offline stuff because we have an online infrastructure which is good enough anyway. So this, this technology which, which is being pushed for enabling offline transaction is actually not that valuable to most banks. In fact, in the U.S., uh, they're moving to MV right now because they have to because uh, we want, again, everyone to move away from Maxtripe in order to, to fully implement EMV for saving costs. They want to avoid doing all the offline firmware things, and they want to do everything online because they know they always have good connectivity. So it, this is one of these scenarios where in order to save costs, you actually increase the security of your system, which is good because if you only implement the online part, the pin will never be transmitted to your car. You will never need all of this. You know, you will only use the chip for the cryptogram generation, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. So, you know, they could do everything online and just be happy with it instead of, of making things more complex. So, and scary thing, uh, after we did our first presentation of this kind, we had reports that schemers dated 2008, so before our presentation, so we're not responsible for this, which is good, have been reported in the wild by law enforcement after, yeah, this presentation was made available. So let me show you what they did, because it's actually 
interesting. This is a criminal, criminally, you know, built ship skimmer. Uh, very, you know, much more professionally made yeah, than it's ours. Even better than um, our prototype. This is actually an antenna here, which can be used to, to relay the information over wireless. Uh, it has a serial number on it, which is really scary. So they made more by one. And if you remember the enclosure of the first of the first uh, point of sale, here it is. So what they did, they pull up the actual entire chip slot and they replace it with something that has this thing inside. You know, and we we think they were using this back in the days where where actually you could just clone to Max right right away. We don't think they were so elaborate to actually uh, uh, skim the, the the pin, but uh, that's only a, a s software uh, issue. You know, the hardware is going to be exactly the same. So people are already doing this in the wild, and it is very important to know how you can leverage your attack by this technology. So. Uh, we thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, we have, I think, no, zero minutes. How does it work? Well, let's just do one question. Okay. Um, anybody? Or I'm sure they would prefer to ask you uh, during uh, break. In person, yeah. In person. Directly. Okay. And also, if you want to see the devices, come to us. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank Andrea you. Daniele, thank you very much. Thank you also for your Oscar-winning movie. Yes. <laughs>